Hallelujah. I got a word that I really feel is not only for those that are on this call tonight, but I just really believe that it's for the body of Christ. And I just want to speak into um, where we're at right now in this, in this timeline of this whole pandemic coronavirus that has come upon the world, that has come upon our nation. Um, you know, we can really thank God that our area has not been hit as hard as some areas. Um, some areas have been hit incredibly hard, and who knows when they'll be back online. But um, I mean, already uh, we're seeing that there, you know, next Friday, there are some counties um, that are coming back online again, that um, some things are going to, they're going to be able to step out. So, so I wanted to talk, I wanted to speak about this, you know, because each and every one of us have dealt with this in different ways. Now, you could not have went through this time and say, well, it didn't affect me. It didn't, it didn't bother me. It didn't do anything for me or, or against me. Um, you could not have went through this time without being affected in some way. And so today what I really want to talk about is not how it affected you physically, as in maybe your finances or your resources or, or those outside kind of things. You know, uh, I know it's all affected us with, you know, it's limited our travel, it's limited where we go, what we do. I'm not going to talk about that today because that is a given. We all understand that. We all know that. We've all faced that. And we've all felt suffocated from that. Um, can't wait to break out. I don't know about you, but I'm like so ready to break out. Um, but I want to talk about how it has affected your soul. Now, I'm not going to talk so much about your spirit man today because your spirit man um, flowed right through the situation. Your spirit man is always in connection with God. Um, your spirit man is constantly even before the throne of God. Your spirit man is not shaken. Your spirit man is so secure. Your spirit man always has the breath of life flowing into it, the river of life flowing through it. Your spirit man is okay. Your spirit man has no um, has no fear. <clears throat> your spirit man is is in an a okay position. Okay, you can you can rest assured that God has born your spirit anew. You have been born again. So your spirit is in connection with the spirit of God. So your spirit man's okay. So just come on, just pat yourself on the chest and say, "Woo! I'm glad my spirit man's doing well." But where we need to talk about is our soul. <clears throat> our soul is the place that's kind of like caught in the middle between the heavenly and the physical. And so our soul realm has to try to understand and work through and interpret all the things that are going on in the midst between my spirit man saying, it's okay. You know, my spirit man is constantly saying to me, Brian, don't worry about such petty things. Brian, don't give that your attention. Brian, 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 oh, Brian, oh, Brian. I feel like I want to break into an opera song on that. But, but my spirit man's being like, it's okay. But my soul man's like, oh, my God, everything's falling apart. Oh, no, what am I going to do about this? I've got to fix. I've got to fix. I've got to fix this. I've got to take care of this. I've got to, I've got to be there. I've got to be there on time. I, 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 I don't have enough energy. I do, I, overwhelm, overwhelm, eh, 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 danger, danger. And so my soul man caught in the midst of this fight, what's going on in my world and what's going on in my spirit, man, is the one that takes the hit. And so I know that I know that I know that we as Christians have been caught in this battle. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Now you might say, well, I have Jesus, and because I have Jesus, I've been okay. Oh, so you're trying to tell me that you didn't have any worry. You're trying to tell me you had no fear. Um, you're trying to tell me that... Um, you were just you were just buzzing, you know, a okay through this whole thing. Um, well, if you want to walk in deception and self denial, you have the permission to do that. But I'm telling you, this is where I want to get to on this call today, is that I know 
You need to mute everybody because people. Okay. I know awesome. that people are people. I know that people. I know that people have anxiety and worry. I know when you lock people up in isolation, it doesn't go very well, that their soul reacts. I mean, that is just a given. Um, psychologically, um, in the soul, it's what happens. And so there's a place where you and I are still human. And you and I must be in touch with who we are as humans, because if you tend to try to be a super spiritual guru and forget about your humanness, you end up coming off as plastic. You end up coming off as shallow. You end up coming off as not real. And the big word that's been in, in our nation for a couple of years is fake. You don't come across authentic. True authentic people are people that are in touch with their soul and are in touch with what's going on in them, um, in the ups and the downs, in the times when they're isolated, in the times when they're free, in the times where troubles come, in times where they don't know what to do. They, Christians are still affected. We're still affected by these things. We cannot just gloss over it and say, I'm okay, you're okay, because that's not what's going on. And so a church that is healthy a people of God that are healthy are a people of God that can recognize what kind of turmoil is going on in their soul. Even when there's a part of their soul saying, no, no, don't, don't talk about that. No, no, don't get too vulnerable. Uh, no, 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 don't, don't even think about that. Just go on. Call the things that are not as if they are. Well, that's wonderful to do that if you, for you know, people of faith. Call the things that are not as if they are. But... If you are in the midst of turmoil, you can call turmoil peace all day long, and it's still not going to bring you peace. Your turmoil will still be in you, and then it all depends on how you deal with it. How do you deal with your turmoil? Well, some people just ignore it. Some people push it down. Some people just go get busy. There's, there's millions of ways to deal with your turmoil, but God wants you to deal with it. He wants you to govern your soul. He wants you to be in touch with what is going on inside of you. Because if you're not real with you, you cannot be real with God. And if you're not real with you, God cannot be real with you. He, people that are not real with themselves, people that just walk in this denial, they, they tend to not hear the voice of God talking about their deep emotional need. They don't have a deep emotional need. They're okay. See, even in Romans 8, verse 26, 28, the Apostle Paul told the Romans, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. And that, that word aid is another word for rescue. I'm reading out of the Amplified. Um, the Holy Spirit comes to our rescue, kind of like the whole thing that happened in worship today, where... Holy Spirit saw that we were in emergency, and he had to rush his presence to us. And so he comes to our aid, and he bears us up in our weaknesses. See, the Apostle Paul wasn't saying that none of us had weaknesses. The Apostle Paul, right here in this first line of Romans 8, 26, was saying, you are human. You will have weakness when you are thrown into situations that you are not normally acclimated to, you will react differently, and your soul will not be sure how to deal with it. Some people go into super control mode. They're trying to control everything. And then other people go into the mode of, I don't know what to do. Ah, they just go into frightened mode. But, but nevertheless, he comes to help us in our weaknesses. He comes to work with us that human place within us that's crying out, even though we keep putting our hand over our mouth and saying, no, 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 don't, don't tell what's going on inside you. Don't share what's really happening. Don't talk to anybody about it. Just keep it inside. Keep it inside. Keep it inside. That 
will cause you to step into carnality. The more you press it down inside, the less of the walk of the spirit you will have and the more the flesh will rise up and you will react in the flesh. You'll react in frustration. You'll react and uh, just keep, uh, just stay away from me. No, I, I want to stay isolated. You'll, you'll react in being sharp with people. You'll react and, and uh, why is that? Why, why does your flesh react? Because your flesh is trying to, to be the aid, the support for your weakness, but it doesn't know how to do it. And so it gets caught between this horrible place of trying to fix what's going on in you, but not knowing how to fix what's going on in you. And that's why Romans, Paul says in Romans, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to help your weaknesses. What does the Holy Spirit do? He comes and helps sort out the, emo the emotional turmoil that's going on inside you. Have you ever been betrayed? Anybody on the call, have you ever been betrayed? If you have been betrayed, there are a million emotions that start firing off in your soul. You don't understand why that person would do that. You don't understand why that person would say such a thing. You thought that they were your friend. And then all of these things start firing off in your head. Well, I should have known. I should have known that I can't trust people. And you know how you think because I think the same way you think. And all these things start just start um, uh, firing off in our mind. And so the flesh comes and starts saying, well, I'll protect you. I will take care of you. I, let's just pull back. Let's just, let's just be self-protective. Let's just make sure that um, everybody that's in our, in our realm of relationships are perfect. Well, good luck with that one because you're not going to find nobody perfect. You're going to find people that have been betrayed. And if you've been betrayed, it means one thing. You're susceptible to betray somebody else. Now, you, you chew on that one. I'm not going to preach on that. If you've been betrayed, you're susceptible to betray somebody else. Because you know all the self-protection that it takes after you've been betrayed. So, so, so unless you let those, 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 that self-protection and all that hurt leave, you end up betraying somebody else. And the majority of time, you betray yourself. You end up betraying yourself. Oh, trust me, I've walked this out way too many years. I know what I'm talking about. But the only way to get through that is Holy Spirit must be able to be, to, you must permit him to come in. You must permit him to come into your emotions, into the chaos, into all the voices that are going off inside you, all the hurt, all those places that say, I'll never be hurt again, all those vows that we make. I'll tell you, some Christians have forfeited their destiny because they've made vows such as, I'll never let anybody get close to me again. I'll never let anybody, I'll never, I'll never. And those are vows that you make with your mind, with your mouth. And when you make those vows, you've set it into motion. And when you set those kind of vows into motion, you have shut down your destiny. God can't do anything. You've tied up his hands. And we've all done it. Oh, I've done it. Oh, I've so done it. I've, I remember times in ministry where, where people came in and hurt me so incredibly hard. Places where I was so soft and didn't know I was so tender. And they would say something so uncompassionate that would just take me down. And, and I, I, you know, I remember, I remember those things. But, but, you know, but I remember the only way I could get through it is when I finally let my walls down and let Holy Spirit come in. And Holy Spirit would come in and say, Brian, you're dealing with a lot of hate. Brian, you're dealing with a lot of spite. Spite is one of the worst things ever. Spite is when you're angry at somebody. And so the thing that they need, then you withhold it from them. Oh, shaka baka. That the thing that they need, you are so angry at them that you won't give the very thing that they need of you, you won't give it to them. You withhold it. That's spite. Oh, there's a lot of that going on in the world today. Well, you did that to me. Well, then I'll give you the silent treatment. I won't relate with you. I won't. But, you know, there's just a lot of that going on. I mean, not outside the church either. It's right in the church. I mean, spite should have no part. See, when Holy Spirit comes in and starts putting his finger on those things in our life, I, I squirm 
when Holy Spirit does that. But yet inside me, I have a thrill. I have a joy because I know that he's not left me in my foolish condition. He's not left me in my anger and my unforgiveness and in my spite and, and all of that crazy fleshly carnal stuff that we can all go to. He's not left us there. He comes in and says, come on, let's sort through some of this junk that came into your soul. Let's, let's throw out the goats and let's keep the sheep. Let's throw out all the negative talk and let's talk about what's reality. Yes, you've been betrayed. Yes, you've been hurt. Yes, I feel that because I've been there. You know, the Lord says, I've been there. I've hung on a cross. I've been betrayed. I understand. But tell me. Tell me about your feelings. Tell me about what's going on in you. Tell me. See, there's too many Christians that will, will not talk to the Lord in that kind of intimacy. I'm not sure what you think intimacy is. Maybe you think intimacy is just that you're in the presence of the Lord and it's just love, 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 and the water of life is pouring over you and, oh, I feel so peaceful. Oh, this is intimacy. I hate to shock you on this, but that's not intimacy. That's called the presence of the Lord. That's called you becoming, um, being one in his spirit. But true intimacy is when you go to the depth of your heart and the things that you that have hurt you, the things that you hate, the things that irritate you, the things that have just frustrated you, the things that are confusing you, the things that you can't make sense of, and you just start pouring it out before the Lord, and you just, you, before the Lord, you're just saying, Lord, my heart is so hurt. Lord, I'm fearful. I'm fearful for my children in this coronavirus, God. I'm fearful for my business, oh God. I'm fearful for this and this and this and this. You know, there's a place where you've got to come in touch with your humanity. Oh, no, but I don't want to speak those kind of things because if I speak those kind of things, then they'll come upon me. Brother and sister, they're already on you. They're already in your soul. They're already in there stirring you up and causing your flesh and carnality to come out. God wants you to pour your heart out. God wants you to trust in him. So, um, Psalm 68, verse 8. Psalm, Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verse 8. It says here, and this is the Psalm of David, Trust in him and your God at all times, O people, and pour out your hearts to him, for God is is our refuge. What does that look like, pouring out your heart? See, so many are walking around with these burdens and walking around with carnal actions coming against others and against themselves. Why? The carnality has come to peak performance because people are not pouring their hearts out to the Lord. They're not coming to God and saying, you know, I am scared. God, I am angry. God, I'm just tired. I am just whipped, oh God. God, I'm overwhelmed by everything that's happening. God, I'm angry at so-and-so. How dare them? God, I'm just... See, there's this place where if you keep that stored up inside, you're going to react in ways that others are going to say, oh, just stand back. <laughs> just stand back because ah, you're acting out. See, Jesus, it tells us in the Gospels how he spent that time with his father. You know, they would be looking for him. Where is he at? Oh, he's up on the mountain again. Oh, he's over there in that clump of bushes, hiding himself, praying. Oh, he's, he's went to his father. Why was that? Because he was being hit hard every day with so many emotions. He was being hit hard in his soul with all of the pain and the suffering of people and all of the rejection and the betrayal that was going on in him. Plus, he was trying to raise a people up to mature them, to get them ready for the kingdom coming. You know, Jesus had to deal with this too. And what was his example? His example was pour out your heart. His example was go to the Lord. Take this time. It's not just to go and say, God, give me, give me, give me, give me. Oh, I'm in your presence now. Now give me something, Lord. No, it's going into his presence and saying, oh my God, I'm so, my heart is so hurt. My heart is so devastated. I don't know if I can get through this. I don't know if I can really um, put my shoulders up and my chest out and walk through this. It's a place of going and letting God see that you're human. You're not some kind of superhuman. Yes, you 
you've got the Spirit of God in you. Yes, you're filled with a supernatural entity, but you still are human. You still have the effect of this humanity on you. Amen? See, in Genesis chapter 1, right at the top of the book, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, I love this, and I've preached this so many times, but it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Now remember this. The earth has a memory of the confusion that was on it. And I really believe it, even in searching out the word, it even talks in the Old Testament about how the land has a memory. Things that were done on the land, even when blood has been spilled, when somebody killed another person, and, and the, the, the land has a memory of these things. The land, the land was formed in righteousness. The earth was formed to be a place where God's glory would come and where a people filled with God's glory would come and tend to it. And so, so we see this, that, that here in the very beginning, there was chaos that broke out on the earth. Now, I don't know what kind of historical thing you come from, but I really believe in my studies that, that when God made the earth, um, there, there was peace. I believe that there was glory on the earth, but somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, all hell broke loose on the earth. And, and, and obviously it must be in there where Satan was cast to the earth. And so he took his anger out upon the earth itself. And so, so it says that there was, the earth was without form. It was void. Um, it means it was in total confusion. Um, the darkness was on the face of the deep. There we got the darkness. So wherever the darkness is, we know that Lucifer is there. And, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now look at this. In the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of what was going on on the earth, Holy Spirit was still there. That word for spirit is ruach. That, that word is the, the breath of God. The breath of God was hovering. The breath of God was watching. The breath of God was concerned. The breath of God was seeing all the confusion that's going on. See, see, even in the midst of your soul being in turmoil, even in the midst of where you don't know even how to process what's going on around you, you don't know how to put it in compartments. You don't know what to do with some of the things that are hitting you and it's making your your soul erupt you don't know but holy spirit is watching holy spirit is hovering holy spirit is in the midst of this and all it takes is a crying out to god oh god i am in i am i i feel like i'm without form i feel like i am void i feel i feel see your emotions cause you to feel are those feelings liars no no, I know that I've heard preaching in the past of people say, well, put those feelings down because those feelings don't count. Well, if you keep stuffing your feelings, you're going to be depressed. If you keep stuffing your feelings, you're going you're gonna to end up on some kind of, 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 of depression medicine. You're, you're, who knows how far it could go? If you keep pressing your feelings down, it is just like a garbage compactor. The more you press the garbage in, the more it gets compacted down. The more it gets compacted down, the more depressed you get. There there is a place, oh child of God, before the throne of God, where you come before him and you let out your feelings. You are human, you've got feelings. You pour it out. You pour it out. You pour your heart out to the Lord. I know some of those feelings might be over-exaggerated. Some of those feelings might be full-blown. But I'm telling you, unless you pour them out before the throne, if you don't pour them out, God can't give you his perspective. You must pour out, you must empty your soul so that God can give you a, his perspective on what's going on in your life. And you and I know it. All it takes is one word from the Lord in the midst of our chaos that causes us to see things totally different. Just one word. One word from the Lord will come and cause all of my pettiness and all of my, my confusion and all of my, oh my God, my overwhelmingness. It'll cause it just to flee. And I'll say, this 
This is why I'm here. This is why I'm experiencing this. This is why you've allowed me to be in this, God. This is why you've given me this road to walk. It's not so that I can have feelings that just overflow me and overwhelm me and destroy me. It's about me dumping those feelings out and getting the truth of the reality of God. What are you thinking about what I'm in? What are you thinking, God, about this craziness that's exploding in my life? What are you thinking about this? I need to know because my perspective is totally confluted. My mind is totally, totally blown out of proportion. But God, show me why. Show me what you're doing in me. Show me how you're changing my heart. And let me know that you're not just allowing these things to happen in my life just so you can sit back and have a nice drama to watch. You're doing it because you see my potential and you want me to grow and you want me to become all that you have for me. How do I get to my destiny? I must, I must embrace my humanity. Just swallow that. Swallow who you are. And some of our humanity isn't pretty. <laughs> Woo! Some of our humanity is not what we would want to boast about. Some of our humanity, I told, I told you last week about how, you know, I came from the Tunstall household and oh my Lord, we were known, we were known in Somerset County as a family, a tribe that was mouthy, mouthy, mouthy. I mean, I'm glad that God has grabbed my mouth because so seriously, none of you would have liked me. You would not have liked me, trust me. Um, but I'm so glad that God took my mouth and he has really refined it. What's that all about? How did he do that? He just didn't deal with my mouth. He dealt with my heart. And he dealt with a lot of unresolved issues in me. A lot of things why I thought that I had the, the right to stay angry at people. The right to be um, full of this angry justice. Um, you know, in, the, in our world today, we have these social justice warriors, um, SJY. I don't know if you've, I mean, social justice warriors. They are pretty much the millennials that are out there fighting for their right to have a say. And even though their say doesn't have half a brain, I mean, they just, they haven't even thought through logically what they're out there protesting for. And so we got these social justice warriors. They want the right to kill babies. They want the right to be able to um, um, not have to work and be paid by the government. They want, uh, uh, uh. What, what is this all about? It's all because of unresolved emotions that are still stirring in the soul. There are hurts and wounds within them that they have not dealt with. If you are, are trying to bring justice through an unrighteous way, uh, it's because your soul has been hurt and you are trying to make justice on your own. The only true justice is the justice of the Lord. It is His righteous ways that we bring justice forth with. So in Genesis 3.8, we see that God is here and he, you know, there, well, let me just go back. Genesis 1, Holy Spirit is there watching. He's seeing the wounds. I, I, you know, it seems to me that the enemy was inflicting so much chaos on the earth. He saw that it was something that God had created and he hated anything that God created. See, that's one thing you need to know about Satan. If God created it, Satan hates it. That new man that God created in you, Satan hates it. And just as God molded and formed the earth, he created it. He created the heavens and the earth. The enemy hates it. And so what did he do? He started inflicting damage upon the earth. He started coming in. I'm sure there were incredible storms and horrible things that were taking place that no man or beast would have even been able to live on this earth at that time that the world was so messed up but see that's what the enemy does to you he comes in and stirs you up he comes in and knows the weak places he knows the wounds that have not been healed so he comes and starts poking you 
And he says, I can stir up that, that chaos once again in them. But, 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 Holy Spirit is hovering the whole time. See, I love this, 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 this um, Hebrew word for hovering. This is one of the most beautiful pictures in the entire scripture. I think some of you may have heard me preach this before, but it, it is worth being heard again. And so in the midst of where the enemy's poking you, he's trying to stir up your chaos again and getting your carnality on full tilt, there's Holy Spirit and he's hovering. And what does it mean? That word hovering means to flutter. It means to flutter and it's the picture of a bird, a mama bird, that is fluttering over her nest. And she's seeing her babies that have hatched out of those eggs. She saw that she birthed them and she hatched them. And now they're starting to come forth and they're starting to spread their wings and she's hovering over them. And it's the picture of envisioning them already mature. It's a picture of seeing her little baby birdies Seeing them out flying, seeing them out feeding and getting food for themselves, seeing them mating, seeing them birthing, seeing them bringing forth and multiplying. It's a picture of the mama bird saying, look what, look what the Lord has done and look what he is creating, that he's going to do something. See, this is the thing that the enemy's after in you. That place of dreaming, that place of seeing the fulfillment of the provision, the fulfillment of the promise, that's what he's out to get. That's why he's brought his confusion. That's why he's come to poke you in your wounded place. That place that you haven't poured out to the Lord. That place that you haven't just dumped your heart and all your feelings and all your humanity. The enemy comes and says, because they have not poured their humanity out to God, I can come and I can stir it up. Up, and I will over exaggerate every part of it and I'll get them angry at God I'll get them not trusting God I'll get them not trusting each other I'll get them turning away from each other but the Lord is saying Holy Spirit is upon you the Spirit of the Lord is upon you to break you out of the jail cell of your mind to break you out of the place where your heart has been become weary to break you out and to cause you to see past your, your circumstances and to see what the maturity of your blessing is that's coming God is here Holy Spirit he oh he is so good at causing you to remember the promise and the vision from which you were called for he's so good at that that's his job he's come to encourage you and I to say don't give up he's come to say come on your heart is mine. My heart is yours. Come. Let me just dump all your ugly out on me. Jesus is saying this morning to you, your ugly does not scare me. It might scare others. It might scare you. But it doesn't scare me. I have seen all the ugly of sin. I hung on the cross and all that ugly was on me. I bore it. On the cross for six hours I carried that stuff I'm not afraid of it I overcame it so why are you holding it why don't you come and just let your heart out why don't you come and just let the and and the Lord says I know some of you are so stopped up you put so much garbage in the garbage compressor that you don't even know how to get it out it's so it's so packed tight in there you don't know how to get it out and the Lord says that's why I've given you a mouth I've given you a mouth to pray to me. And prayer, prayer sometimes can be can be crazy. It's just coming to God and just, oh, I'm so, so messed up and I hate that person. And, ah, I can't believe they did that to me. Or, I'm just tired. I'm ready to go home, God. Oh, come on. Tell me nobody else thought that. Just get me out of here, God. I'm tired of it. Take me home. Take me home. And God's like, okay, all right. I'm really glad you're pouring this all out. Come on, you got anything more in there? How about that little thing down in the corner? You know, that thing that you're just, you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Oh, come on, get that out too. Tell me about it. Come on. Jesus isn't freaked out. That's why his name is called Wonderful Counselor. Come on, somebody say Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor, are you ready to hear 
all the ugly in me. And he's saying, I am. My spirit's hovering over you. Because what is his purpose? Holy Spirit's purpose is to restore you and I to the original image, to the original intention that God has created us to be. And so he says, come on, come on, Brian, that junk in you doesn't belong. Get it out. Get it out. Come to me. You might be a sobbing mess. You might, you might have to kick your desk a couple times or kick the sofa by the time you're done. or Just don't kick the dog, okay? But you might, you might just have to slam your fist down on the table a couple times and say, God, I just don't understand this. Or, you need to get out of you what you have collected over the years and during this isolation. You need to purge. And there's, and I'll tell you, I, I would advise you not to go purging to people. Because there are some really dark things in your soul. If people would hear it, they would probably want to give you a Valium. Or they would want to get you into some kind of shock therapy. But there are dark things in your and my soul. And you and I must come into contact and let it pour out before the Lord. He will not be shocked. He is a lover. And the whole time you're pouring out your ugly to him, he is listening to every single word. He is not turning away. He's not putting his fingers in his ears. He's not saying, oh, too much drama. Your God doesn't turn away from you because there's too much drama. In fact, he'll come and try to draw all that drama out of you because he knows that it's taking your life away from you. I don't know. Maybe I'm just preaching to me today. Okay. Genesis 3.8. Genesis 3.8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And you've heard me teach this before. That word cool doesn't mean that the temperature dropped. It means Holy Spirit blew in. That word for cool is ruach. It means that the breath of God blew into the garden. And so they heard God walking in the garden. They felt the wind of Holy Spirit breath. And what did they do? They hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of God and among the trees of the garden. This is what's going on in a lot of God's remnant saints right now. This is what's going on in his bride that he's preparing. I know this. I've heard the Lord speak it to me. His bride are pretty frightened at the carnality that they've seen in themselves. They are pretty shocked because running around being busy, being here, there, being with this person, that person, all of your issues and your carnality can just lay in the bottom of the barrel. But why do you think they put people in prison? Why do you think that that was the reason from the beginning that they started to imprison people? Because they saw that when they put someone that was harmful to society in prison, it does one thing. It makes them get in touch with their own self. And even though they were saying they might have murdered somebody and they were still saying, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty. A lot of times a year in isolation will break people and make them see that they're not so righteous after all, that what they did was foul. And it gets them in touch with themselves. I'm telling you, some of this isolation was meant to imprison us, to get us to a place where we could see some things that were in ourselves that were not, that's not going to take us to our destiny. It's going to cause us to keep, they're like, they're like potholes on the road, on the road. You know, how many of you like the Pennsylvania potholes? You know, you're driving along, everything's fine and wonderful, and all of a sudden you hit a pothole. 
throws your whole car out of balance, throws your front end out of balance, throws you out of alignment. You're, you were going straight, but all of a sudden you're going crooked. See, that's what some of these things do in our life that are potholes within our soul, wounds in our soul, causes us. that, And then they don't appear. Listen to me. They don't appear. I know this in my own life. They don't appear until you're just, ooh, you're just cruising along. Da, 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 you got the radio turned up and hallelujah, born to be wild. And you're just riding along, cruising, cruising, cruising. And all of everything's fine, everything's dandy. And all of a sudden, you hit the pothole of your soul. And kaboom! Might even blow a tire. That's why when God starts putting his finger on our potholes, we stop and ask Holy Spirit to heal it, to fill it up with the macadam of heaven, to fill it up with the black top of glory. Because that thing will come out when you least expect it. That thing will pop out when you don't want it to pop out. Come on, I'm talking from experience. I could give you a hundred different examples, um, but I don't have the time to, so... Um, um, it might come out in a book I write someday. You never know. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> glory to God. But there they were. They were hiding. They stuffed their sin. They stuffed their hurt. They stuffed their shame. They stuffed all these things. All they needed to do, can you imagine if the scenario changed? Can you imagine if they would have just come out of those bushes and said, God, we're so sorry. We tried to get something that you already gave us. We were deceived. I can't believe we did this, oh God. You know, I don't know what God would have done, but, but no, they hid themselves away. They were like, no, no, we don't want God to find us. No, no. See, what's going on in your soul? How about some of those feelings? How about some of those places you're feeling overwhelmed? How about some of those places you haven't felt honored? You felt like people are treating you unjustly. Why don't you go to God and tell him about that? What are you doing hiding in the bushes? Some of the situations in your life, it's true, they're unfair. You're not trying to tell God that, that you need to just to suck it up. No. God's saying, stop sucking it up. You sucking it up is causing your trouble. It's causing your depression. It's causing your carnality to come out. Stop sucking it up. You know, like they say, suck it up buttercup, you know. Stop it. Go pour it out to God. Go lay it on the line. Go let them know how you feel. There God was. Blew into the garden to talk to them. And they wouldn't. And on down in Genesis 6, God says, My spirit's not going to strive with man forever. What is the top thing that the Spirit of God strives with us about? Come on, let's, let's throw everything else out. What is the thing that Holy Spirit comes and wrestles with us about the most? Now, let's, not just about you individually, but clump us all together. What is the top thing? The top thing is that we will not pour out our heart to the Lord. That we try to take up our own cause. We try to fight our own battles. We try to stand up and bring justice for ourselves. And the whole time, Holy Spirit's hovering over your confusion, saying, it doesn't have to be this way. Pour it out. Tell me your weakness. I'll come bear it up. I'll come aid you. But pour it out. Don't be afraid of your humanity. It's who you are. You know, when I was thinking about this whole message that, God was talking to me about. He took me to a really unusual scripture that I wasn't quite sure how to plug into this. And he took me to Ezekiel 37. And Ezekiel 37, you all know this, uh, it's the whole, um, um, Isaiah was, or, or Ezekiel was picked up in the spirit and he was taken to this valley of dry bones. And um, Ezekiel 37, 1, one says, um, the hand of the Lord came upon me, brought me out of the spirit 
brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. There's the word Ruach again. The breath of God literally picked this man up and carried him away and sat him down. The word sat down means he came into the rest of the Lord. In other words, there was no anxiety on him. There was no fear. He was in perfect peace. And what does the scripture tell us? Perfect, uh, my mind is, is in perfect peace when my, uh, I'm in perfect peace when my mind is set upon the Lord. I find it myself in his strength. And so Ezekiel had no fear about this, but he was set down in the midst of a valley, and that valley was full of dry bones. Now it's kind of interesting, because if you come to a valley of dry bones, that tells me there's been an awful lot of people that have died. Not only people, but an incredible amount of dreams, an incredible amount of purpose, um, so many things that was on your hope list, was on your promise list, all those things died in the valley. Things that you once saw them up moving towards their destination, moving towards their purpose being fulfilled. And, and now here's Ezekiel sitting in the midst of bones, even, even the, the flesh had been eaten from it. It had they its purpose, it looks like its purpose had been been lost. It looks like all purpose and all destiny was dead. It was gone. And there he sits in the valley. See, this is what can happen to you and I in the valley. When you and I come into these places where where such confusion and chaos is taking place in our soul. If you do not stand and believe the word of the Lord and declare the word of the Lord and remember the word of the Lord, your dreams can just be a bunch of dead bones. And how can you put them back together? It would take a lifetime to put them back together. But then even after a lifetime, it would still not come back to what it was. I have a feeling... And I don't see this in scripture, but when I read this, I just had this sense that Ezekiel was sitting in the midst of these dry bones, and he was like, oh my God, this is such a mess. Everything is dead. I don't know how to even put this back together. I have a feeling that there was an overwhelming emotion upon Ezekiel's soul that he was like, I don't know what you want me to do. I'm sitting in the midst of this dry bone. I'm sitting in the midst of death. I am so, so messed up. See, some of you have been living in the culture, and the culture seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. And, and all you do is complain to everybody else and complain on Facebook about it. But why don't you start going to God and say, say things like, God, this, this, this injustice that's going on in my culture. God, it's making me feel this way. It's making me feel like I don't have a say. It's making me feel like my vote doesn't count. God, why don't you go start talking about some of those things to the Lord rather than just storing them up in your own heart and letting your soul get compacted with junk? Why don't you go to God and say, God, all this that's going on in my nation, it's just breaking my heart. It's making me feel like there's no righteous in the land. Why don't you go talk like that to God? That is intimacy because you're bearing your soul. You're bearing your heart. And I'll tell you, that's why King David was a man after God's own heart because he knew how to tap into his pain. He knew how to tap into his heart. He knew how to tap into those things that were over overwhelming to him and pour them out to the Lord and he went into the tabernacle and 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 most of the time they these, these things were so locked up inside him they were so locked up and so as soon as the music started playing he started praying oh God he started singing out oh God help my soul oh God created me a clean heart oh God the world has went crazy and it's overwhelming me oh God oh God lift up my heart oh God help me uh, and he started pouring these things out in song to the Lord because he didn't know how to unlock his soul I have a suspicion today that the bride the remnant, those that are moving forward, those that are getting ready to emerge in the next season, they are in this place where their soul is so locked up that they're not sure what's going on with them. They're not sure how to get in touch with the pain. I'm telling you what, the only way you can deal with
with pain is puke it, puke it out. You vomit it out. You vomit it out of your soul. You speak it. You use your words. Oh, you go to God first. But then if you have a trusted counselor, somebody that you know that will, that will withhold, that'll hold you up, somebody that will help you, you go talk to them too. Don't go talk to just anybody. You go talk to those that you know that have also tasted of the darkness in their soul. Because this is the dark hour of the soul that's going on. But God wants to emerge you out. He wants you to be pure. He wants you to be able to govern your soul. And so here Ezekiel is sitting in a valley of dry bones. I'll tell you what, if, if I was sitting in a valley and all I could see were dry bones, as far as I could look to the north, the south, the east, and the west, all I can see are dry bones. I'll tell you what, I would feel rather downhearted. I would feel rather hopeless. <laughs> Don't you be hopeless. Because I'll tell you, down in Ezekiel 37, verses 9 to 10, Ezekiel starts seeing God's perspective. Somewhere, I believe it, I believe somewhere in this, in this scenario, Ezekiel poured out his heart about all the dry bones. He, so he poured out his heart of what was going in his soul, on in his soul. And then once he got, when he got rid of that, purged it all, then the Lord said to him, Hey, Ezekiel, now I got, so I got reality for you. I know you, t you, you told me all about your feelings. And I know that you know these feelings have really caused some trouble for you. But Ezekiel, I've got something for you to say that's truth now. Hey, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to my breath. I want you to prophesy to my Holy Spirit. Son of man, man of after my own heart, man that just poured out his heart to me, telling me about how hopeless he is about these dry bones. I want you to prophesy to my Holy Spirit. And I want you to say, Holy Spirit, come from the four winds. Come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. O breath of God, O breath of heaven, come upon all my dreams that have been slain. Come upon all this hard time that I've been through. All this, it looks like there's been such a death. Holy Spirit, I prophesy to you, come and cause these dry bones to live again. <laughs> and so Isaiah, Ezekiel said, yes, my heart is emptied of all of my pain. I will now take on the word of the Lord. And so Ezekiel prophesied as the Lord commanded him. And the Holy Spirit blew in. And the dry bones started to live. They stood up on their feet. And it said that it was an exceedingly great army. See, that which has died, that which is making your soul feel like overwhelmed and discouraged, when you dump that all out before the throne of God, and you have these steady times of counseling sessions before Jesus. I'm talking about appointed counseling sessions. Counseling sessions where you just say, God, I am a mess and I, gotta, I come to tell you about it. And I don't have to worry that you're going to go tell anybody what I'm telling you. Because you'll hold it dear to your heart and you'll heal me. See... In this hour, you and I need appointed counseling sessions with the great I am. You and I need time that you just take away. You don't have to pay for this kind of counseling. It's already been paid for. The blood paid for it. It's already done. It's already done. Go and dump your heart out. Tell them about your children. Tell them about the stir that's going on in your heart that just causes you pain every day. Cause them about, tell them about the fear, the things that you would never tell anybody else because you're too afraid. Come on, get rid of your fear with God. When you have, when you have totally destroyed your fear, that's when intimacy will become enlarged. When you don't fear God anymore, as in being afraid of telling him everything. Well, if I tell him this, he might just turn away from me. No, no, no. No, no, no. When you go tell him all the ugly, 
He's going to say, now that's the Brian I know. That's the Brian I created. That's the Brian that really is walking in reality and authenticity and realness. That's a Brian that's come out of the shallow of, oh, I'm okay and everybody else is okay. No, when we come to him and pour out our heart, he says, that's what I've been waiting for. That's intimacy. That's intimacy. If you can't bear your soul with God, you are locked up and you are in prison and you are blind and you can't see. If you can't pour your heart out to God, it means you're in a straight jacket. You can put on a good act. You can make yourself look spiritual. You can make yourself look like you're the most spiritual in the land. But true intimacy comes from one who will lay themselves prostrate before the Lord and say, here I am. I'm not hiding nothing from you. I'm not hiding in a bush. I'm not hiding in my spirituality. I'm not hiding behind how much scripture I know. I'm not hiding in anything. Here I am. I'm naked before you. Oh, if Adam and Eve would have just come out and said, we're naked. Help us. We're naked. We're naked. See everything about us. We're naked. Come and help me in my weakness. I can't imagine that the mercy of God would have over, overlooked them. The mercy of God would have come rushing in. There's three things here. Three points that I want to make. And they all start with the letter E. When Ezekiel sat down in that dry bones, he could have sat there just saying, Oh, this is okay. Oh, no, this isn't going to hurt me. I'm all right. Everything's fine. Yeah, they're just all dead. I'm just sitting amongst death. But yeah, yeah, it's all good. Me and Jesus, we got a good thing going. Just me and Jesus. I know I'm sitting in dry bones and, and my soul is in chaos, but me and Jesus. It's just about me and Jesus. And Jesus is the whole time saying you're sitting in dry bones and your soul is a mess. See, when you and I come into these places, the first thing he wants us to do is have our eyes wide open. He had to set Ezekiel down in the midst of dry bones to give him such a shock to say, this is reality. I know I had something, I'm not going to go into the details, um, Lord knows, but I came into something this week that there was just a hindrance and then i started seeing that the hindrance was not satan the hindrance was god and i saw that god wanted me to get something in order in my life something that i've left slip and and then when i saw that i was like yes you want me to live at the highest example of you ever and you want you, you set me in this place of dry bones, and I felt it. I felt the dry bones. I felt the hopelessness of it. I, I felt all that. But, but then I started seeing, oh, no, this is way beyond that. This is way beyond God just condemning me or convicting me. This is God saying, I am going to bring an army out of this dry bone thing in your life. I'm going to raise this thing up. That place where, where there was weakness and that place that doesn't look so good, I'm going to cause you to be, I, I, that's going to be a stellar part of your life. And I felt the assurance of the Lord. But first of all, he said, Brian, you have to have your eyes wide open. And, and my eyes were. I mean, I was hit face to face with this thing. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know it was that bad. And seriously, that was my first reaction. I didn't know it was that bad. Oh, my. Why? Why did I just skip all around this and not know it was this bad? And then I was just shocked at me. I, I really was. I was like, okay, my eyes are wide open and I'm seeing how bad this is. But I'm seeing how it was easier for me to deny the situation. And so I went to God and I started, pulling my, I started pouring myself out because I was so shocked at me. I really thought that I had a handle on something. And I was shocked because I didn't. And, and I went to him and I just started to express the second E word. First one is eyes wide open. Second is express. And I went to him and started expressing my, 
my disappointment in me and my disappointment that I was walking around with my eyes shut, that this thing was right there around me the whole time and I didn't even see it. And, and so I started to go express to him and I started repenting because I knew that I had failed. These dry bones came because of me from something that I, that I lacked, something that I wasn't doing, something that I just forfeited, something that I thought would take care of itself. And, and then I started to see, I, I messed this up and I expressed that all to God. I poured out my heart and I said, you know, some of, some of what I've been walking in over the last couple of years, God, is coming because I have forfeited this. I have let down my me. I've let me down. Nobody's let me down. I've let me down. And so when I poured my heart out, I felt this freshness, just this freshness come upon my soul. And then I, I heard the Lord say, you're going to get a victory out of this. You're going you're gonna to get an incredible victory out of this. And I was like, Lord, I, I didn't, you know, and I, I wanted to reassure my heart. I said, Lord, I didn't come to do this and say this and get intimate with you like this and really pour out my heart to get something, to walk away with something in my hand. I said, I just want things to be right between you and I, and I want to walk out a life that is really worthy of who you are and to be that example. And so I didn't, I didn't come out of this. I didn't come to get something from you, God. I came to let you know that my heart is with you, that my heart wants what you want. And, and then I heard him say, you know, Brian, just stretch forth your hands and, and receive my healing. It was just that simple. He didn't come and berate me for an hour, reminding me of all the dirty deeds that, you know, all the things I, I omitted that I didn't do that caused this to happen. He came and said, receive. And, and that's the third E word. Engage the healer. Let your eyes be open to what's going on, to the things that you need to pour your soul out about. And then express it. Second E word, express it. And the third E word is engage your healer. Engage your healing God. How do I engage that? Well, as he's pouring love over me, I'm sitting there as I'm receiving in the healing, and I'm saying, Lord, all those feelings, they weren't a lie. All that disappointment and confusion, they weren't a lie. They were truth. They were things that I was really, really feeling, things that my soul was in turmoil about. And yes, that was reality. But now I'm coming and engaging the healer. And now I'm getting truth. Now I've set all those feelings aside. I pushed them all aside. I got through them. I purged them all. And now I'm coming and I'm just receiving one thing, the one thing, the only thing that will heal me. And I just lifted my hands and I said, I receive your love. I just receive your love. You wanted me to pour out my heart to you. You wanted me just to tell all the ugly and how I omitted something that really caused me some trouble. Well, I'm coming now and I'm pledging myself to you anew. But, but more than me just doing that, I'm coming and just saying I'm receiving love right now. Because your love is bigger than all this, and your love can heal this, and your love can repair this. And you've been hovering over me, Holy Spirit, the whole time, trying to get my attention on this weakness so that you could come in and let me pour out my heart and then come in and undergird me again and repair me. And I'll tell you what. Like I said, I'm not going into the whole testimony because it's just personal for me and Michelle, but, but I did that. I laid that before the Lord. And two days later, I had this major victory. That thing that I omitted that caused me some real problem, God broke through and went above and beyond, exceedingly abundantly above what, <laughs> what I could even ask or think. He just broke through because I bared my heart. And I started to see how how his whole heart is to restore our soul. His whole heart is to get us to purge our soul of all the junk that's going on. And how many of God's people are not receiving their victory, not receiving their breakthrough, because they would just rather, they would just rather let 
their storage units be filled with all kinds of, of harmful emotion, harmful feelings, feelings from the child from childhood, feelings from how your parents um, neglected you and abandoned you, feelings from how your husband or wife deserted you and divorced you, feelings from how you've been betrayed and feelings from all the things that have been lost in your life and you don't know how to even regain it. And feelings of how you, things that came upon your life, that uh, sicknesses and, and heartaches that came upon you that you still don't understand. And it's a place where you've got to go pour it out to the, to the Lord Almighty. He's waiting to hear from you. He's waiting to hear from you. In Psalm 23, it says, He leads me <laughs> beside still waters. He, he wants our soul to be that place of still waters. That no matter what happens, that we have a place to come pour out to Him. And let our soul come back to that place of peace again. But it doesn't stop there. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. I absolutely love this scripture. And I love what the word restore means in the Hebrew. This, this, this is something I pray for myself and many all the time. Because that word restore literally is the picture of God pushing the reset button. That's what it means in the Hebrew. That God pushes the reset button of all the turmoil, all the pain, all the overwhelming, all that place where your soul is so locked up that you can't even talk about it to yourself. You can't talk about it to God. You can't talk about it to others. And here comes the Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> And he pushes your reset button. And he causes you to be able to pour out your soul to the Lord. King David, he had the art of, of pouring out his, his soul. He excelled in that art. Places that hurt you, stop tamping it down. Stop pressing it down. Stop acting like it's okay. You go to God. You pour out your soul. Don't, don't you even think that you're going to find somebody on the earth that's going to understand all of the feelings going on inside you. Because brother and sister, you're a deep well. God made you so deep. Even if he fell in there, he'd have a rough time finding himself. <laughs> you're deep. You and I can't even get in touch with our emotions most days. But I'll tell you, there's something about when you start pouring your heart out to God and you just start with that first sentence, God, I'm just really feeling overwhelmed. Pretty soon, it's almost like one of those old pump, those old water pumps. You start priming it and pretty soon it goes from a trickle to it just starts pouring out and you're like in tears and you're just crying out to him and you're letting him know the plight and the problem you're in. David said, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him from his holy hill, and God came and rescued him. I know, I know this word was for you today. I know it was for you. Because I was getting ready to go back into... I've, I've preached it now for what three, three last my last three sermons. I was getting ready to go into, going back to tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and 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 the Lord said, and I heard the Lord say, no, soul care, soul care, and I was like, soul care, does that mean we're gonna have like some real soul music today, Lord? You know. Yeah, let's get down, baby, baby. Let's have some real soul music, and and. But the Lord's like, no, I want to care for people's souls today. I want to care for their soul. They've all been through a lot. And a lot of them don't even realize what all they've been through. They don't realize even how it's affecting them. 
So this Zoom conference call is still muted. You might be in a house by yourself or a room by yourself, or I don't know, you might even have loved ones sitting around the sofa with you. I don't know. But if you're alone, I want you just to take this time and just pour out. If you're not alone, I just want you to do it in your heart. And, and if you can't do it fully where you're seated, seated right now, I want you to just take time today or tonight. And I want you to go to the Lord and I want you to tell him the things that are really bugging and irritating you. And you know what? Some of those things might be about him. You might be, God, I'm, I'm just really irritated at you because you didn't do this, you didn't do that. You need to tell him. That is the deepest level of intimacy that you can go to, is when you tell somebody else how they've hurt you. And, and you know you need to do it to purge your soul. And then the most beautiful part of that intimacy is when they come back to you and say, you know what? I have walked that out too. I've had people that I've hated and not forgiven too, but I'm sorry and I forgive you. There's nothing more beautiful on the face of this earth when two people come into like spirit and like heart and like mind and they come and reason together. And there's nothing like you and I going to God. And if you're mad at him, you better tell him you're mad at him because he knows it. He knows you're mad at him. And what I love about it is he hasn't lifted his spirit from you. He keeps hovering over you even while you're mad. <laughs> Go figure that one. Because most of the time when somebody's mad at you, they walk away. But I'm telling you, God is not like a man that he would lie. He'll stick with you until you're healed. Until your potholes get all filled up and you can get back in your car and drive 180 miles an hour and not even fear a pothole because you know you're healed. I'm going to pray a prayer and ask Holy Spirit to reveal to you that place where he's been poking you. That place that he's wanting you to open up. The place where he wants you to tell him just what's going on in your soul. Just what, what's causing you pain. Why are you short with others? Why do you get angry so quick? Why are you always trying to escape? What are you escaping from? You're not escaping from people. You're trying to escape from you. It's not people that's irritating you. You're irritating you. You need to let God know. You need to come into the deepest level of prayer that you've ever been in before. And it's the prayer of pouring out your heart. It's the prayer of being real before the Father. Don't gloss it over anymore. It's killing you. It has the power to take away your destiny. It has the power to take life from you. Now do like your elder brother Jesus did. Go climb some high mountain and go just dump it all out on the Father and get his perspective and then come back and life will be so much more joyous and life will have so much more purpose. So I'm just going to reach my hands out and I'm going to pray for you. And I just want us to take this time. I want us to take this time and just time of silence. You know, you might have, you might have 20, a list of 25 things that's just irritating the heck out of you. Well, why don't you just do one or two right now? <laughs> you can take the, the other 23 and work on those later. And honestly, some of you, the way you deal with things is you write things down. Some of you might need to make a list. And you write down these things that's going on in your soul. Your, there's these feelings that are going on. These fears and these traumas. And, 
Some of you have lost some valuable, valuable things in your life, and you're still not over the loss. You still believe that if you gain that back, that you'll lose it again. If I get financially successful again, I might lose it again. Oh, if I really fall in love with somebody again, I might lose them again. Oh, if I really get close to somebody, oh, they'll betray me again. I'll be stabbed again. See, those thoughts and those feelings are not God. And if those thoughts and feelings are going on in your head and heart, it means you're still wounded. Yeah, you can play the game that I'm okay, you're okay. But if those things are still in you, it means you're still wounded. You need to go vomit all of that out before the Lord. And you need to cry out for his help. And then you need to receive from the healer. So, Father, I've said everything that you've asked me to say today. And, Holy Spirit, I've clinged to you to bring forth this message with, with sincerity. And now I ask, Holy Spirit, for you to do the work in my brothers and sisters. For you to lift them up, O oh God, that they are not weighed down, but that they come into this whole new height of living in the abundance of Christ. That they come into this whole new level of intimacy that, that they've only touched once or twice, but they start realizing that it's a daily, daily thing. That it draws them nearer to you. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you take the words that you breathed out over my lips, so that you would take it to their heart. In any place where they may be in denial, oh God, pour out such love and grace and tell them they don't need to be afraid of their humanness. They don't need to be afraid of being human. And oh God, that they would just come out of the bushes and say, oh God, here I am, all my wickedness and all my nakedness. And this is how I'm feeling. I feel so ashamed. I, I so messed up. I so, oh God, this is the, this is the depth of repentance of telling you how we feel about these things that have come into our life, how people have left us and how people have hurt us and how we've lost this and lost that, telling you how, how hurt it made us, how it made us feel, it made us feel abandoned, it made us feel like, like we were all alone, it made us feel like, oh God, where are you? Oh my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh God, let us, let us get real with us and pour out our hearts today. Let us be a people that don't hide behind masks anymore. We can do that with people, oh God, but we can't hide in our mask with you because you know us. And I want you to know me. I want you to know me in the Holy Spirit. I want you to put your finger on the, the pain that's still, that's still circling inside me. The wounds that are still open. The wounds that I've patched up with my fig leaves. Rip the fig leaves off today and show me that you've come to kiss my wound and heal it. Show me that you've come to kiss my wound and heal it. I thank you. You're not afraid of my wound. You're not afraid of getting some kind of virus or bacteria by kissing my open wound. You're not afraid. So, Lord, I lay my feelings, I lay my soul, I lay it before you. And I ask for you to pour love and kisses out all over my wound. All over the things that are causing me to act out. Causing me to be fleshly and carnal. It's all because my soul has been hurt. God, come and give me that big, big kiss that totally releases your love on me and heals me and shows me why I walk through that, shows me what I gained through it, shows me how you equipped me through it, how you strengthened me through it, God. I thank you. You're showering your kisses on your people on this call right now. I thank you. You're kissing. You're saying, I'm not social distancing. I'm kissing. I'm kissing. And I see the Lord kissing your wounds, kissing the confusion in your soul, 
And because you see that he loves you so much, you're willing to pour your heart out. You're willing to tell him everything. And he says, tell it to me. And the more you tell me, the more I'll kiss you. And the more I'll heal you. And the Lord says, I will give you victory. I will give you victory. There are several on this call. There are several on this call that you are separated from people. Now let me, let me just tell you what Holy, how I feel Holy Spirit showing me this. That you're separated from them and um, you're not in contact with them. And you're not in contact with them as much as you need to be in contact with them. God put them in your life to be a real blessing to you and to, to, to help fill up your soul. They've been put in your life to be a blessing to your soul, to comfort you, to, to help strengthen you on your hard days. And, but you've been separated from them. There's at least three. There's three or more. There's the, you've been separated from them, and, and it's caused so, so much turmoil in your soul. It's just that because, because those people are a part of you. They're a part of you, and, and God's made them like a piece of the puzzle to fit into you. And you've been angry that you've not been able to connect with them, that you've not been able to have that, that real deepness with them. Some of them have already passed on. Some of them have passed on to heaven. And there's still a longing in your soul. Just You would just love to be with them again. And some of them are just separated from, from situations that are way beyond your control. And God wants you to talk to them about that. God didn't do this. God didn't separate them from you. Circumstances did. You need to talk to God about it. You need to tell him how much you, you what you feel, how your heart is hurting because you're missing this person so much. Is it wrong to miss somebody? No. No. It's not at all. God gave us people in our lives, people that we love, that we, they, they love us. They bring joy to our soul. You need to talk to God about that. There's a couple people on this call that your soul is really hurting because that one you love is not with you. You need to speak to the Lord about that. Don't gloss it over. Don't deny it. Holy Spirit. Is putting his finger on some things with a word of knowledge right now. There's some people on this call that you've just kind of come to a place in your life that says you've reckoned yourself that, oh, well, people are going to hurt me. That's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. I just got to, I just got to buck up. They're going to hurt me. You just brought it to a place of saying people are insensitive. So this is my lot for life. Take up my cross. And that's not, it's not that I'm saying that's not truth. There is a certain amount of truth in that. But the other part of the truth is, I don't care what they do to me. I'm going to love them back. Even if they have turned totally from me, have destroyed my reputation, I'm going to love them back because there is an incredibly deep wound in them. And I'm going to ask you, Father, to give me compassion for the wound that's in them, that I'm not going to be looking at the wound that, where they stab me. I'm going to be looking at their wound and saying, hurt people hurt people. And, oh, God, I'm going to pray for my enemies that stab me. And I'm going to turn this whole thing around that I'm not so focused on having everybody else come and help me heal my wound. Oh, you just can't believe what sister so-and-so did to me. Oh, brother so-and-so, don't get around him. He'll stab you. No, that wouldn't, be my, that wouldn't be where the godly would go. The godly would say, sister so-and-so, I pray to God for you, 
for you to do such a hurtful thing to me, you must be hurting a hundred times worse than I am. See, that's the heart of God right there. And so it takes my attention off of me. Yeah, I pour my heart out to the Lord. This is how this made me feel. But God, I'm going to focus on my brother, my sister that is really hurting. And I'm going to ask not only for my healing, but I'm going to engage with the healer for my enemy's healing. That's when you know the love of God abounds within your heart. So let's all be lovers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Well, I don't believe I'm going to open up um, the call for us to talk. I just think these are some things that we need to sort out between us and the Lord. And I think it's a place where we need to find that quiet place before God. And maybe you need to cry. Maybe you need to go full banshee effect. Maybe you need to just let out your anger and it wouldn't be pretty for others to hear it. Maybe you just need to go in silence before the Lord and come out of the bushes and lay yourself naked. I don't know. Each one of us deal with these things in different ways. There's not one right method. But the right method is to pour your heart out to the Lord. And I ask God to give you such incredible grace. And let Holy Spirit give you aid and power to pour out your heart. That you won't hide nothing from him. Oh, but God knows my heart. He wants to hear it from you. Because he knows it's, he it's healing when you speak it out. So I say to you, go heal yourself. Go heal yourself, saint. Just like Jesus used in the word, physician, heal thyself. I say to you, bride, heal yourself. How? Dump your heart out to the Lord. Let it take time. It might take time for you to prime your pump. But don't leave that place of his presence until you feel the weight off of your soul. Because he wants a bride that is so authentic and knows him and he knows them. In Jesus' name, I love you all. I'm praying for you. I know God is lifting weights off of your soul. And I know that when we see each other eye to eye and face to face, that you're going to be lighter in the spirit than you've ever, ever been. I know it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you all much. Mm.